After a lifetime of researching the dynamic and enigmatic world of light entertainment, I've decided to ditch my notebook and meet the people who inspire me. What makes them the people they are? How do they feel about the show business landscape in which they find themselves? And in a world where anyone can be a star, is there still a need for performers who have universal appeal? Come with me on a journey of discovery as I get a unique insight into Britain's favourite stars with a little help from my glamorous assistants. Yeah, well, I say glamorous, more like hazardous. And of course, we'll have a bit of fun along the way. Writer and actor Simon Greenall first came to public attention playing the intellectually challenged porter Michael in the popular sitcom I'm Alan Partridge. A string of television roles including ITV's Benidorm and the children's series The Octonauts cemented his versatility as a performer. Then in 2008, Simon was put forward to voice the character for a series of advertisements for Compare the Market, thus giving birth to one of the most famous felines in Britain, Alexander the Meerkat. I got up with the star of stage and screen to talk partridge, python and car insurance. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr Simon Greenall. So, the first time I became aware of your work was in the sitcom spin-off I'm Alan Partridge. In what ways did the character of Michael naturally expand over the two series? And is it fair to say that Michael was Alan's only true friend? <laughs> I don't know. If, did he expand? Michael's not really that expandable. This, this is what you see is what you get. He's a fairly he's a fairly simple basic character. I think deep deep down he's very shallow. There's nothing much to him. He's it, he's just he's just a very ordinary bloke, and he's 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 kind of all the guys that I grew up with, in that they were they were very kind of straightforward, um, and just were very kind of simple, very working class, very you know. I let's go drinking. Let's go. Let's go out drinking. And if the pubs is closed, let's go and, uh, and maybe get some badges or something like that, or do it, or find some scrap. You know all that sort of stuff. Very kind of low aspiration. Yeah, but no, I, I don't think he, I don't think he evolved. When he first came to the garage from the hotel, yeah. Well, again, it's it's a, it's another one of those jobs that those blokes get. It's it's you know, to him, it's it's the, it's the pinnacle of responsibility to be in charge of the till. And it, again, it's 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 semi uniform, isn't it? He's he's, he's wearing he's wearing his garage uniform. And he's in charge of that little bit. That's his world. Like you know, he's in charge of that. And this is you know, it's just pinnacle of his. Uh, Promotion. Lance Corporal in charge of streets. <laughs> uh, then, of course, Alan had his moment on the big screen. What were the main differences between film and the TV series compared to Alpha Papa? It was freezing cold. It was that very, very cold winter. Um, four years ago? Three years ago? Mm. I can't remember. Four? Five. Um, and it was bitterly cold, and we're up in Norfolk. And it was mostly outside. And we were filming on the pier at Cromer. Christ, it was freezing. It was absolutely freezing. I think it was like one degree away from uh, legally not allowed to be working. <laughs> and, and, but they said, no, it's still warm enough for us to go. So yeah. we did. But yeah, it was cold. Well, and, and, well, and also it's, it's, it's filmed. So there's no, there's no studio audience. So you get no kind of immediate uh, kind of feedback on, on whether what you're doing is funny or not. Mm. Uh, Steve had just come from doing Philomena in Ireland, so he was a bit kind of jet lagged, spaced out, um, and and was plunged into the film. And there was a lot of pressure on the film, a lot of pressure for it to be funny, a lot of pressure for it to be good, a lot of budget pressure and stuff like that. So it was a different working environment, but kind of old school people around, which is good. Hmm. Okay. Um. Setting Partridge aside, in 2011 you appeared in the BBC drama Holy Flying Circus, oh, yeah. surrounding the making of Monty Python's Life of Brian. Yeah. Two questions. Were you already a Python fan, and what did this teach you about Python's contribution to the development of British comedy? Yeah, I was a, I was a Python fan from very, very early on. I think, I think it was about 11 when it very first came out in 1969, and 
I remember, because I was, I was allowed to stay up late because my parents didn't really care. Um, and I remember watching it and thinking, this is brilliant. It's like weird and great. And it was, and I was a big fan of the 1984 show, uh, which is a thing that uh, they'd done previously, a kid series. Um, and I thought it was fabulous. But what, <laughs> what eventually put me off it was going to college and everybody quoting um, Holy Flying Circus, uh, 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 Monty Python. And that completely put me off it. I couldn't abide the people who liked Monty Python because <laughs> they because they weren't funny, but they but they had a license to be funny because they could quote big chunks of Monty Python. Mm. And um, people go, "This is this is too silly." And and you think, "Oh, shut up! That's not funny. Don't that's that's you're quoting somebody else being funny. Stop it." So that that kind of like tarnished it for me for a long time. But I, when I was a kid, I had all the books. I had, I had matching tie and handkerchief and stuff all the books and then doing that I loved that show and I thought that show would be shown a lot more but um, the cast were too big so the repeats were <laughs> too expensive so it didn't get shown very much but I, I really enjoyed it I thought it was good good, um, good good insight to that world that has kind of gone now because the idea of blasphemy and 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 the Christians getting upset now is just so alien but people did. People boycotted the cinemas and stuff like that, and, and thought it was being horrible to Jesus, which it wasn't. It, was no, it wasn't even about Jesus. He appears in one little bit, a bit like the Bible. Josh said, don't think it's ironic that it, fall, it fell in the same era as Love Thy Neighbour. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but not as funny. No. <laughs> but apparently love more them. offensive. <laughs> God, Love Thy Neighbour, yeah. Well, I, I used to work I used to work with the guy who wrote that um, at LWT. I, I worked at LWT for a long time. And he was, um, and was he Silla's writer? Yeah, he used to write the stuff for Silla. He used to write, he used to write Silla's show. What was his name? But yeah. Um, probably the most bizarre component about your career is you're actually the voice of Alexander Meerkat from the Compare the Market adverts. Yes, correct. How did that come about? Uh, well, it's 10 years yesterday. Really? Yesterday was the anniversary, 10 years uh, since I first walked into the uh, recording studio and they said the agency there's a lot of people from the agency there and they said um, what do you know about this project I said well it's um, compare the markets you're looking for a meerkat for compare the markets I'm guessing it's market meerkat meerkat market and they went how do you know that I said it's just Dick Einstein to work that out <laughs> I went oh right <laughs> Because they were quite pleased that they'd worked it out, that they'd come up with this thing, and uh, so then, so then they said they, they wanted a Russian voice, and then they'd been looking at Putin on on YouTube. They'd been watching him, and they said, "Okay, like Putin, like Putin, but cuter." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, okay. Uh, and I'd done. I, I wasn't. I was. I was no, by no means in the early casting. I was like way towards the end. They were getting really desperate. Because they'd had uh, Russian actors in and they'd had Russian speakers. They'd had all sorts of people in for it. And my agent kept ringing them and saying, look, get Simon in, get Simon in. He'd, he'd be perfect for this. Um, and I had done a Russian tiger for them, for Texaco, for a, a load of books for Texaco. I'd done a Siberian tiger, who's Russian, but it was very like that. It's very kind of uh, aristocratic. You know, elegant, sinister. So he did that voice for them, but they said, no, he's got to be kicker than that. But and also they had this idea, they had this idea that he was sort of like a like a Russian Alan Sugar. So they were thinking something like this kind of voice. So he's sort of tough guy. No, I do this. I'm in business. And they showed me the kind of the rough drawings. And I said, well, he's, he's he stands up on his hind legs and, and, and meerkats do that. And... And I said, is he ever going to be the same size as humans? And they said, no, 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 he's always going to be more or less meerkat size. I said, well, he should really have a voice which 
is quite small and has got a lot of energy. Kind of like, you know, funny, and it can be like this and that, and you know, haha. <laughs> so the, so we, we did test and test and test, and we worked, I worked on it and worked and worked it. And eventually, what clinched it was that I started making noises. Because I thought, oh, he's, he's, he's an animal as well. So I, I would go, um, compare the market. <laughs> compare the market. <laughs> And stuff like that. And they went, oh yeah, oh like that. That's funny. That's funny. Sorry. I said, well, how about at the end? Because they they came up with the line simples. I said, let's let's what's called a, a mnemonic hook, which is for kids really. That if you make a funny noise or a thing or a or a bing at the end of a commercial, it's what sticks in kids' minds. The French use it a lot. If you if you ever get the train in France, it always goes bing boom. The petit comes from the Liège. Oh, like that. Bing. The you know, thing the, the French. They're forever doing that. They've always got this like. Ding, bang, boom, at the end of any announcement, mm. and it and it just it just holds your attention. So I said, "How about if he goes ah, at the end?" And he said, "Do it again." I said, ah. I said, "That's brilliant." What's how do you do that? And they were all trying to do it. They couldn't do it. So then, um, so then, yeah. So then we launched on New Year's Day, nineteen uh, twenty. Uh, what's ten years ago? Twenty oh eight. Yeah. Um, I was in Buenos Aires. On holiday and I got a phone call I mean he said Christ get to a recording studio as quick as you can we found one in the suburbs of Buenos Aires they've got an ISDN line I said what 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 she said the meerkat thing I said oh that did, has, 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 has it gone out it's gone out they've gone mad the whole country's gone mad for it people are talking about it and it's so big so I had to go to Buenos Aires and start recording more stuff because they, they hadn't got enough they hadn't got enough material to put out because people were asking for stuff and stuff so yeah that's what happened so that's how it all came about and now people were buying yeah. stuffed toys on eBay. Absolutely, and getting yeah. uh, two for one meals as well. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then Sergey, Sergey came along about a year later, maybe not, maybe not as long as that. But Sergey was only ever supposed to say three words, and they said, "Oh, he's a, he's a Russian nerd," and these are the drawings that we've got so far. And I said, "Well, he might he might be like that. He might be like some quite nerdy, you know." And we can make him be funny if he was like that, but the Russian. And I went, yeah, okay, that's right, because he's only he's only ever going to say computer not working. I said, I said that's okay because it kills my voice. <laughs> he said, yeah, yeah, fine, just do it. Ah, computer not working. So they went, yeah, great, great, thanks. And then they came back, and went, people love Sergey. <laughs> Everybody who works in an office loves Sergey. So here's. Hundreds of lines of Sergey. I was like, oh no, I can't do hundreds of lines. And sometimes Sergey will have like a speech to do. And it's virtually impossible because about halfway through you just run out of voice. Because it's very difficult. Because also with this voice, you cannot really breathe properly. <laughs> but what they like now is just Sergey taking the piss out of Alex and laughing. Yeah. <laughs> Another. Sorry, should that have been a shorter answer? No. <laughs> yes, for an hour and a half answer. <laughs> Another completely different role when you were cast in children's show, The Octonauts. Captain Barnacles, yes, that's right. <laughs> now, a lot of people go, wow, you're Captain Barnacles. I think, mean, well, it's not that different from my own voice. <laughs> it's, not, it's not really, a, it's not like the meerkat, it's not the ramp. <laughs> it's just me going a little bit posher and a lot braver. <laughs> Captain Barnacles, yes. And uh, this Friday, we're doing Children in Need, Radio 2. Oh. Captain Barnacles and Quasi were... Uh, take over the show lovely there you go <laughs> there you go <laughs> that's As, right Captain Barnacles right? and I I with Captain Barnacles because it took off and kids loved it and stuff and people would say oh do, do you catch phrase <laughs> I'll go send out the patrol no 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 the, what you say at the end of the show and I I only recorded it once I'd know I'd, I'd, and it, I say it at the end of every show I didn't know, I don't, and I, so I had to. I had to watch one to find out what my catchphrase was, which is um, "explore, rescue, and protect." Barnacles out, and that's what people stop you for. <laughs> people stop you to go. I'll oh, go and do it. I'm going, I don't know what it is. <laughs> but as an actor, how important do you think it is to embrace like different audiences, and so to be able to, I suppose, for your own sake, maybe CV, to be able to say that you can cater for. Yeah, I th but I th but to, to be honest, is that a, to is be that honest, a thing, to or? be honest, if you're doing the sort of stuff I'm doing, you're actually just amusing yourself, and if it happens to work, then great. Yeah, but really, you're just messing around with your own voice to find out what you can do. 
and not do. And so it, you, you're more or less just making yourself laugh. And when you do voice stuff, you're kind of, you're a bit schizophrenic anyway. And you can practice stuff in your head. You can practice a voice in your head mm -hmm. and then kind of launch it fairly well, ready, ready formed. Yeah. Because in the Octonauts, we do lots of um, crabs and sea lions and bloody fish and herrings and alligators and seagulls and all sorts of stuff. And because it's an American, uh, UK audience, there's a, there's a bit of a crossover. So they'll say, oh, let's, let's, can we have, can we have like a Texas shark? So you may be going to do a shark, but, but uh, he's, he's from Texas, so he's going to be big, but he's also going to have a lot of teeth. So you've got to kind of bring that out there. So yeah, it's, it's, it's not adapting to a different audience. It's just constantly showing off <laughs> is what it is and getting paid for it. Lovely. How did you know how do you know what a Texas shark sounds like? Well, actually, a uh, Texas shark is just based on... Do you remember Hank, King of the Hill? It was a big cartoon series on Channel 4. Yeah. Uh, hold on there, Bobby. You can't do that. <laughs> oh, Dad. Yeah. So you never met a Texan shark? You just, no, you never. Just take so, it I'll go, <laughs> so I'll go, filing system in head, shark, lots of teeth. Texas, fuck, I don't know. Uh, oh, Hank, King of the Hill. I'll just steal that voice. I've got it in my file. Yeah. Then bring it out. And there you go. You got it right there. <laughs> uh, but growing up, when I did in the nineteen sixties and early seventies, we we were desperate for cartoons. That there weren't there weren't the cartoons that there are now. Mm. There are no kind of cartoon. If there's a cartoon challenge, if there, if there was a cartoon channel, we would have never gone out. And we used to we used to watch. Sergeant Bilko, because there was a bit of a cartoon at the beginning and a bit of a cartoon at the end. We were desperate for cartoons, and, but we had some fantastic cartoons at the time. You probably don't know them. Stuff like um, uh, Deputy Dog. Yep. Deputy Dog, Deputy Dog, he's musking the watermelon patch. Stuff like that. And we just used to consume it. And also, we used to, we used to consume it in such a way because we got one bite of it. We got one go. There was no recording it. There was no watching it again it was on at 4:45 so we we were we were completely dedicated to these shows so um, and we just took it in I, I took it in like a sponge you know, mm. all the cartoon characters so were you not fans of monkey dust just to see that right he wanted to write a question about it but it's so surreal yeah he sat there thinking to himself I want to write a question about it and he just <laughs> gave up <laughs> Yeah. Let's start with how surreal is it? <laughs> it is weird, it, and it was way ahead of its time. And it's the thing that I'm easily the most proud of. Yeah. I, the, the 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 producer uh, who sadly died now died you know, ten more years ago. Uh, Harry Thompson, he was a brilliant producer, and he would just he would make you work. He would because he he knew that we were all most voiceover artists are a bit lazy, and they'll just pull stuff out that they've used before. And Harry Thompson would make you do it again and again and again. He said, "No, no, no, that's lazy. Something different. Something. Give me something different." And he would make you. He would make you be the best you could be. And we'd have things like, um, like the uh, uh, Ivan Dobsky, the meat safe murderer, who was like a, a serial killer, but he was really big. He was huge, and I thought it'd be funny if he had quite a, you know, his testicles haven't dropped properly. So, so that was his voice. And then um, I was the pedo finder general as well. I am a pedo finder general, and I accuse you of being a pedophile. <laughs> that was way ahead of its time. And uh, we, also, we also did, um, oh, we did um, uh, the, the jihadi kids from Birmingham. We, we, it was all way ahead of its time. It was great. Monkey Dust was fabulous. Since the dawn of television comedy, Writers and directors have surrounded themselves with like-minded actors who they trust, in turn creating a sort of in-house stock company. Steve Coogan and Armando Iannucci did a similar thing with The Day Today, and then later I'm Alan Partridge when you came into it. So as an actor, what benefit is there of being involved in a group like that? Uh, you're usually with people who are way cleverer than you are. <laughs> so, so that's quite good. It makes you up your game. Um, trust. 
in the in that you can you can do stupid stuff you can you can you can say um you can say outrageous things you can say things that you shouldn't really say that you or that you wouldn't say in public or 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 in a normal conversation um and because it is so outrageous or offensive or dark it then takes you down that road and think oh right okay yeah we won't go that far but we could go that far down that road that could be interesting hmm. because there's a in the in the in the final final episode of the first series of Partridge uh, Kevin Eldon <laughs> Kevin Eldon is a kitchen salesman who says um, uh, too many blacks <laughs> about where he lives in London and that's it he's then chucked out of the uh, of the party mm. and that was I, I uh, that we were doing a long improvisation it was all improvised and we we're doing a great long improvisation and I was getting really bored with it all and I thought I'm just going to chuck in a verbal hand grenade and see what happens and Kevin Eldon said uh, he said oh yes I uh, I live in London uh, Acton in, in Acton in London and I said all right, does all the blackies not bother your man? And Amanda went, oh, Christ, no, no, whoa, no, you can't say that. You can't say that. No, that's, whoa, mm. stop, 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 no, no. And then he went, oh, hang on. How about, oh, we can give Kevin that. How about Kevin says that? Because we can chuck him out of the party, but we can't chuck you out of the party. And Kevin Allen went, I'm not saying that. I'm not going to do that on national television. But then it, it did. So so yeah. So that so so it's that it's that world of trust. It's that world of uh, of knowing each other well enough that you can say pretty much whatever. Do you get that sort of freedom when you're doing the voiceover work where you're allowed to use your own sort of creativity to? Yeah. Well, they're, they're, they're usually looking for that. They're usually looking for your for your input for your ideas. I mean, you've got to you've got to steer a fine line. You can't you can't take over. Uh, because you'll get hoofed out, but you can put stuff in. Yeah. Because often when they write stuff, because ad people, ad people are not they're not dramatic writers, and and they they tend to they tend to write in a very um, stilted literal way. They, they don't use abbreviations. They don't use because because most people use bad English. You know, when when people it's like if you're out in the street and that people don't speak. You know, a lot like you should and that and things and they use like abbreviations and the wrong thing and you know it costs three pounds and stuff like that whereas they'll in an ad they'll say it costs three pounds you think well no the character isn't he's not going to say that the character's going to say it costs oh, it costs three pounds yeah and they'll go all oh, right oh yeah yeah that sounds like a real bloke so so they're, they're looking for that they're looking for for you to bring something to it mm. and I've, I've 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 been in auditions where actors and I, I always think, oh man, don't read the words, don't read the words. The words are they're not lines, they're guidelines. Make it make it sound like like the builder that they want, like they like they like the barrister that they want. So sort of humanising. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Bring, exactly. Do you think that's why you've been as successful as what you have? Because you've, yeah, you've got think, an ability I, to I do that. I think it is, because I'll, I'll look at it and go, okay, I'll I'll give them their version. Yeah. Always. I'll always give them their version. And I'll say, look, can I can I just try Something a bit different. Can I just can I just knock the edges off that hmm. and and make him sound a bit more streety, a bit more, or it could be even it could be very posh. It could be, you know, in posh people they don't really move their mouths very much. They are so sort of lazy. They don't really speak very much, so they tend to um, just sort of because they all understand each other. They don't really care. So so yes, yeah, so it just brings something to it. Yeah. Um. So. You've already mentioned a little bit, but we just wanted to ask you, looking back over your career, what would you looking say? Looking back, hang on, I'm not dead. Reflecting. I'm retired. Uh, on reflection. On reflection. Yeah. What is your proudest achievement? Uh, monkey dust, I'm very proud of. The, the, the partridge stuff yeah. was, was good. And, 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 and people still say, oh, it makes me laugh. And somebody said the other day, I said, oh, if, we, if, we, if we're you know, at a loose end at the weekend and nothing's happening, mm. we'll just put on partridge and have a laugh. And so I think that still works. Yeah. Um, I don't know. You see, I've, I've always been, I've always been more avaricious than ambitious. Yeah. It has always been a, well. It was a, it was at first it was girls and money, <laughs> and now it's just money. <laughs> I've I've always been. I've never been particularly ambitious or artistic. I've always been shamelessly 
after the money. So, yeah. <laughs> Is it true you played Sid James? Yeah, that's right, yeah. In yeah, I play Sid. But yeah. I, don't, I don't do it like, I don't do it, I don't do Sid James. Because Sid James was a, he was a South African, he was a South African dude, a cockney, and his voice is virtually impossible to do. And he also had a bit of a broken nose. Uh, they were doing um, the Lost Hancocks, it's the Lost Scripts. Yeah. The BBC recorded, I can't remember, 101 or something, and they lost some of the recordings. Because in the old days, uh, magnetic tape was expensive. So they used to just go into the archive and go, oh, let's, let's use that, and they'd pull anything out and record over it. Mm. Um, and they lost, I think, six or eight recordings of Hancock. And then the scripts turned up about two years ago. And uh, Neil mm. Pearson said to the BBC, can we make, remake these? Because mm. they had Kevin McNally, who's a brilliant Hancock. They had uh, Robert Sebastian, who's a fabulous Kenneth Williams. And they couldn't find out, they couldn't really come up with a Sid James because his voice is there are people who can do his voice but but not in a but not make it work not be funny so I so I had a go <clears throat> they initially wanted me to try and do the voice I tried to do the voice and I said this it just doesn't work it, it sounds weird and actually once you, if you don't know Sid James his voice is very odd because he is a South African doing a cockney and I said what I can do is I can do you like a Cockney wide boy <laughs> in the in the sort of vein of Sid James. And I can be that sort of wheeler dealer, um, bish bash boy sort of geezer. So that's that's what happened. So I, I play a version of Sid James. It's not it's not an impress, impression in any way. Right. Yeah. Did you have to do a lot of research for, the, for that part? Well, I, I did. I, I, I watched a lot of Sid James. Mm. And the more I watched, the more I realised I couldn't do his voice. <laughs> I just couldn't do it. Putting I, you off. I could get close, mm. but it sounded strange. It sounded quite weird and quite sort of up there somewhere. And, he, and also, he, because he's from the 940s, he talks really quickly. And it's, it's really hard. I thought, well, this isn't going to work. It's gonna it's gonna stand out rather than blend in, and people just accept that that's that's what the Sid James character is because 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 you've got fantastic Hancock you've got fantastic Kenneth Williams that's enough, and I can sort of slightly hide behind those two, It'd still be funny because Sid Sid's lines were very funny in the in the show, and also Sid Sid in the in the radio series tended to turn up towards the end because he was usually filming out at Pinewood. And they wrote the scripts so that you could turn up at sort of five, six o'clock, have a quick look, and, and then do it. Which is more or less what I do now. <laughs> I'll be doing a voiceover, then whiz over to the radio and do St. James. But yes, I did play St. James. So, Correct. As we've established, that uh, your career is still definitely going. Yeah, thank you. And on reflection and not looking back. <laughs> Looking forward, <laughs> what's next for Sonic? Uh, well, what's next? Um, another series of there's an animation series called Hilda, which I did last year, which is on Netflix. Big, it's big on Netflix, big in America. Uh, so I'm doing another series of that. Um, I think I'm doing another kids series uh, called um, Love Monster or Love Monsters. Um, uh, lots of meerkat stuff. Uh, there's more Octonauts to come. That I, I, I think I think my face is retired, <laughs> but my voice is still going to keep working. Yeah, because the I suppose the meerkat stuff is its own entity now. As, yeah, it, it, as well, long cause, as it's because because we're, we're, it's big in Australia as well. It's uh, it's going huge in Australia, yeah. so we do a lot of Australian stuff, mm. and we do radio, online, TV, yeah. cinema. Internet, all yes. sorts. Yeah. Yeah. You kind of forget about that, don't you? It's yeah. sort of everywhere. I suppose you have to it's record everywhere. everything for different. And everything's got to be recorded. Yeah. Okay. I think that's it. I think that's all the questions we've got. Thank mm -hmm. you very much. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you very much. Perfect. 
A big thank you to our guest for being the subject of another Beyond the Title interview. If you like this, why not browse the website and see if there's anything else that takes your fancy. Don't forget to like our Facebook page to receive updates of forthcoming interviews and to see more information about me and what I do. Thanks again and hopefully see you next time for another Beyond the Title interview.